and myself. Uh, these are extensions of this principle, I would say. The second one hmm, would be addition logics, so quasi classically. Logics. Uh, so they show, these logics show complementarity. but are still value definite. Because if you read some of those papers, they give you the impression that uh, once you get complementarity, you, you don't get, uh, you, you just get for free value definition. This is not so. And, and, and actually, the computer, the whole branch of computer science started, uh, started with, uh, with a man, uh, Edward Moore, imagining if there are, as I mentioned yesterday shortly, if there are uh, finite automaton models for complementarity. This started this Moore automata and Moore automata, the media automata thing and all of that. Initiated by quantum mechanics, that's, that, that's something that computer scientists often don't know that this entire branch started with this quest. It's like uh, there exists a British movie, Helen of Troy, uh, a woman who, whose beauty uh, launched a thousand ships, you know, against Troy. <laughs> <laughs> and Edward Moore launched these ideas, very fruitful ideas, turned out to be computer science. And um, the third one is Ben. Full L type inequalities. And <coughs> if you hear, or if you will listen to Professor Grangier this, uh, later this day, I think he will use a lot of those things to, uh, to argue for uh, value indefiniteness or for for quantum supremacy or weirdness. Um, and this is a systematic way um, of, um, by the, uh, by the, by the, uh, by uh, some, some geometric method to, to obtain um, classical bounds on probabilities. Uh, which are then valued, uh, violated by quantum probability. And this has been developed or popularized by Pitovsky a lot, but actually Pitovsky was not the first who did this. We, uh, hardly uh, realized how many people that Foisson had a paper a couple of years before Pitovsky suggesting the same method, and there have been other people not in the quantum mechanical context, Gosson, Vidovsky, and Sirensen uh, apply this to the quantum, but they have, they have been other people in measure theory suggesting that you could uh, employ a convex set um, and uh, the Weil Minkowski theorem in order to compute the height once you get the vertices. So I, I did some work with Kutowski on that one, and I, I think I, I had done a lot of work with this, and yeah, I think we added some, some new aspects to, to, this, uh, to this finding recently. So I would like to ask you which, uh, because I may not complete all of it. You know, I may, I may collapse before, uh, before I finish all of them. Uh, so what, what, what is your preference? What, what, what is your taste? I'm willing to. Do you have any preferences? Maybe the first one. The first one? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. I like all of them, and it's a challenge. All of them are challenges. 
And then the second one is probably this one. And the third one, see, this, this third one has some, how should I say, uh, hyper philosophical consequences. Yeah? I prefer the same one. Uh, the second. So, yeah. Second, okay. Uh, uh, that, that's interesting. I thought that everybody would vote for the third one. And for me, at least, I understand uh, classical logic. So. Ah, but that, that, that might turn out to be a surprise to you that, you prob that, there, are, that there exist uh, modes of deriving such things which are so, um, how should I say, fundamental that you only do it with those modes afterwards. You know? Because the original derivation by, uh, by Bell, uh, for instance, and, and how, how some people are doing that, uh, of course, in a sense, I do with these, these methods, but these methods are very powerful. Okay, so, so this is the first. So this is about, I will talk about Kitovsky's principle of indeterminacy. <coughs> Yesterday we, we did the following thing. We developed this notion of context as a maximal, with which you may think of as a basis, an autonomic basis of a, mostly we were using 3D space, real Hilbert space. Um, one example is uh, uh, example, the fast quality proof example of um, the coach Becker theorem I used four dimensions in that space. But um, for what comes now, I will mostly use also three dimensions in that space. And I considered several bases which were interlinked in a certain sense in 3D that you always rotated, that, that you connected two bases uh, by rotating uh, by rotation along one single axis. Of course, in 3D you can cannot do two, uh, because this would uh, result in identity basis. And again, we are talking about autonomic basis here. And um, I call these basis context. I'm free to do that. And in a sense, they are, by the spectral theorem, uh, can be thought of as constituting projection operators, and I think I gave you uh, the idea how to construct from a um, normalized, from a uh, unit vector, from a non-zero unit vector, a projection, a one-dimensional projection. And, and if you, so if you start from the basis, I'm just, just reviewing the joint. If you start, let's say, from, usually one has the Euclidean, are the, the, the um, Cartesian basis in mind, but it need not be. If you start out with this, um, you then go to the projection operators. I mean, this is a shorthand, the I. Please uh, think of this, the, the entire definition uh, for the mathematicians. Uh, so you go to the projection operators, and uh, from that, you can define, not uniquely, but define a maximal operator. Um, <coughs> please have a look at the high mode volume, high mode finite dimensional Hilbert space. It's a very fine small volume uh, undergraduate text who 
who extensively discusses this. It is actually also in the conscious Becker paper, but uh, I think this is more, more consistent in the Hadros paper. And this and everything can be identified as being equivalent to a context. So this, this uh, kind of formalizes the notion of context. Yeah? Um, now, as I said, I can draw this Vigrici diagram, I can draw a context in such a way that smooth, unbroken lines, let's say in screen D, um, characterize the context. Let's say this is E1, E2, E3. For, for those of you who are not familiar, the only thing that is, oh, this poor dog. If you were in China, I would think they were. <laughs> but not here. Across the lens. So the only thing you might be shocked about this, uh, or the mathematicians might be shocked about this, is a notation. You know? mm -hmm. uh, because uh, who has the guts of writing a vector like this? This is Dirac. I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot. Uh, this is not my fault. The notation. I'm just getting, I'm trying to get you used to it. But, I mean, also in, 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 in publications, one usually doesn't write it like this. But this is a uh, standard quantum notation of a vector. <coughs> and you may think of it as a project of this. Um, so, and, and, uh, just, just to make, uh, to give you an explicit example, if this is, uh, let's say, x1, and to xn, we are talking about uh, n-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, this is a uh, representation of the components of the vector, and you have to multiply it by unit vectors of that. Uh, yeah. So, and, and if you're talking about a system which is orthogonal, then you need to multiply it. Uh, product in product way by itself but by its transpose or if you if you are talking about complex space about its um, a joint which means that you multiply this with that with all of these so at the end you end up with a matrix which is n point n matrix x one squared x1, x2, x1, x3, and so on, x1, uh, xn. It's actually a tensor. Yes, it's a tensor product. Yeah. And, but in physics, it's, I, I think it's also called the Attic product. So, it's, so xn, x1, and so on and so forth. X. <coughs> yeah. I'm a little bit slow in the, in the morning. But I will mean, warm up later in the day, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this is the way, if this is a unit vector, of course uh, the norm uh, of this, so this vector, the Euclidean norm should, should be one, uh, you get a project. And, and why you get an orthogonal projector? Uh, and this orthogonal projector is characterized by, uh, the, by two properties. One is that I wrote an E here. One is hidden potent, which actually means that you can multiply it with an arbitrary factor, and it will always be by induction. And uh, it's self-adjoint. This is this this characterizes all. Uh, there exist uh, non-orthogonal projections, which are called oblique projections, which are also funny to talk about. But I'm not talking about this here now. Um, so you might you might think of this also as. Uh,
projectors. And in a sense, in quantum mechanics, uh, as, uh, projectors have a dual role, one as a pure state, on top of projectors, pure state, and one as an elementary proposition, an observer. And you bundle this observable together via the spectral theorem to get the maximal overlap. Okay, you could just say, um, I want, to, I want to create an A maximal operator of I call that R. This is contained in the later papers of high motions in the commuting sections. When we discuss commuters, commutators. Uh, we just create one by saying, well, I have lambda i, which are different, and I have this E i. <coughs> I always used to take just be on the safe side the lambda i to be uh, prime numbers. Then you're always on the safe side. Excuse me, may I ask if the senses are maximal? Uh, Sorry, I'm maximal. Uh, it's maximal, yeah, I discussed this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, it says that there is a theorem in uh, functional analysis uh, or in finite linear vector space theory saying that if you have a bunch of of operators like n, well, I call it a, 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 i, and b. Yeah, exactly. So, so if you have the commutator of a set of projectors, a, i, such that uh, this vanishes. So they are all commuting, which in quantum mechanical terms means that these projectors, that, that these uh, observers, if they are self joined they can, can be simultaneously measured. Then you can find, then you can find a so-called maximal operator such that all the AIs are, of course, not identical, but are functions of that. That are. And the reason for that is because uh, the, the projections in the spectrum, if they commute, you can prove that they are all the same. They can be made the same if they are that they generate. Yeah? So this is, this is the, the idea behind this. And, um, so, so one can think of the entire thing as a, as a maximal operator. This is, this is how I would think of that now. Just, just, to, just to give you, just to tune you in into, the, into this uh, music of, of the Bidowski theorem, or of our theorem of, of indeterminacy. Now, once you got um, the notion of context, of course, you can go wide by interlinking context. So I, I discussed this. Thomas also gave you an idea how it looks like in 3D. You know, it's just interlinked, two interlinked contexts, and from this everything can be constructed. You know, they are just rotated contexts, and you can do all kinds of weird things, construct all kinds of weird constructions. Now. Pitovsky's theorem says principle of indeterminacy. It was in the early 2000s, I believe, of Pitovsky. Uh, it's, a, it's a paper, in, a very nice paper in uh, Journal of Mathematical Physics. Look it up. Uh, if you are more interested in this, but I believe we have a more direct proof, and I give you uh, and, uh, with, with, more, with stronger, with weaker assumptions. It's always good in mathematics. This has the following thing. Given, I mean, he says it differently, but I, I rephrase this here now. Yeah? 
given um, uh, a state, a pure, a pure a system, a, a quantized system, prepared in a pure state, in some pure state, you know, you can just say, my pure state, I want it to be, I want my coordinates to be, uh, the pure state to be 1, 0, 0. You, know, you can always, without loss of generality, I think, in the previous the um, Then, all observables, let, let, let's make it more explicit, because we are here, uh, yeah, this is the pure state. Then all observables which are not orthogonal of these observables I mean projections, for instance, projection operators. And those projection operators again form um, maximal form context which are not orthogonal and not collinear <coughs> can have a definite classical truth assignment. Formalized by a two-weighted measure which is context independent. So I, I just repeat what a Classical truth assignment means. A classical truth assignment means that if you get three atoms in a context, then do you, do you know what I'm trying to say now? That only one atom uh, needs to be uh, assigned to value one, and all the others remain zero. So it's uh, so in the context only one. Let's say this one uh, is one, and then all the others of that context don't need to be zero. And this gives you the liberty, of course, to choose either this one or this one as the sign one. Right? So let's, let's choose this one. But I could have also chosen this one. And then of course this, this is zero. So this is a value, two value measure of this so-called L12 structure. It's called L12 because the uh, the, the, the recycling logic or the recycling algebraic structure um, contains 12 elements, but I don't, I mean, I just drew the atoms here. You know, they are, they are, if you draw the Hassel diagram, they are, they are, they are two uh, Boolean blocks pasted together along a single line. So, so everybody got this? It's very simple, but it can get very complicated if you use more sophisticated graphs. And, and I can have it show you in a second the sophisticated graph which, uh, which will be able to, to uh, achieve certain things, uh, in particular proof this year. Now, Mitowski, I was talking about two valued measures. Yeah, and what is important here is that this value here doesn't change uh, uh, as a function of the context. Because you can think of and can propose this, this is called 
okay, from both that, well, um, actually you can, you can destroy any such argument by saying that in this context this appears to be zero, but in this context you can, you can have one. Yeah? So, so it's, a, it's a suggestion that around this, around this context, this is fine, but if you look at the bigger picture, you can have this, and then of course this. This would be context dependent. I'm not talking about this situation here because I'm excluding such cases. Of course, if you can have context dependence, uh, all hell breaks loose. You can, you can do anything, basically. But I insist that, this, that, that the intermediate observables must have the same value. Ah, non-collinear. Non-collinear means it doesn't. Um, um, it's not. It's not. Uh, it, it cannot. It, it's neither in the direction or in the uh, inverse, in the reflected direction. So. This is, I, 
I can prove that this eventually turns out to be uh, very good. Now you can say, but, but, you just told me that I can invent a two-value stage which is totally viable. It looks like that. And the answer to that is that yes, if you only look at that, I would call it quantum cloud. Quantum cloud for me is a collection of interconnected contexts. If you look at that quantum cloud, you're okay. But I can give you zillions of other quantum clouds where I can prove that if this is true, this can be neither true nor not true. So this can be neither. If this is one, this can be neither zero or one. Neither nor. Sorry. This can be neither zero nor one. But for that, I need another quantum cloud. Now I call it. You know, this is the quantum cloud. But with this quantum cloud, I'm still fine. Okay? <coughs> and Mitowski, I mean, proof that everything that is um, not obviously by your definite. And the obvious way your definiteness must be just if you prepare something, then everything that, that is in the direction or minus the reflection is value definite. And also everything that is orthogonal to it must be very definite, must be zero. Because the one you prepare to identify with one, so the others must be zero in the entire plane. That, that's for sure. But everything else is very indefinite. That's, I feel, very strong. You know, it's, 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 in a sense, it's much stronger than Coach Specker, where he says, well, I can give you some configurations which are finite. Uh, uh, and and uh, two valued measure doesn't exist. But but here you point out uh, that that if you define something, the rest which is not uh, co-measurable, which is com complementary, the rest is undefined. It's provable, so even by finite means. Now the proof. Um, of Pitovsky is quite involved. He has two papers of that um, <coughs> proof, one with a co-worker. But uh, we could find an easier proof which used um, a particular quantum cloud. And the structure of the quantum cloud is like this. I, I just give you the structure and then I show you the cloud. But for this I need the internet because I, I cannot throw it out of you will, you will see it, it's quite, yeah, it's quite important. Yeah? So, the structure is the following. Here you have an end. A starting point and an end point, I just draw two. And the argument is actually quite simple. And you say, well, without loss of generality, I prepare a state like this. This is the Instead, and then I have a quantum cloud which leads you to an end point. And I identify the starting point and the end point. So they are both the same vector or project or observer or proposition. And the quantum cloud one quantum cloud 2. The quantum cloud 1 has the property that so this consists of a, of a quite involved uh, connect, connect, connection uh, uh, collection of interconnected uh, contexts leading from this observer from the uh, starting point to the terminal point such that 
I can prove that only one true value exists and this forces this thing to be a true implies true cloud. So this is a a tint. And I can give you another quantum cloud which for, which also has only one true value measure, which forces you to accept that this is false. So with that quantum cloud, I argue that this can't be true, and with that cloud, I argue that this can't be false. And the only consistent alternative is to say that it's not defined. This is, this is basically the argument. The, the new thing here is, the new feature here is that we have a value assignment which is a weaker, weaker one than the Bitovsky. Because Bitovsky assumed that you have um, an, an overall measure which is everywhere defined. Uh, we have, you know, uh, Chris Carruth is a computer science scientist and from um, uh, and, and the computer scientists, the theoretical computer scientists there, they actually, I think, may take uh, any, this, an excuse to do good logic. Uh, since he mean has this, this notion of a partial function. Now, a partial function, if you excuse my, my physicist standpoint, makes a joke out of the notion of a function. Because originally a function was invented by Newton and Leibniz to say, I plug in one argument and I get out the definite other argument. Other, otherwise, I would uh, use a relation. You know? So a function is uh, the, the ingrained uniqueness of classical physics. Now in computer science, they discovered they don't want that. Clini uh, was the first to propose that certain, if you plug in some value, you just, you just can't compute it, and you can prove that you can't compute it. And uh, they built all kinds of uh, theorems on that. So, so basically, they have this notion of partial function and versus total function. So what the physicists call function is actually their total function. So whenever you plug in an argument, it's totally defined. But uh, in, in, uh, they have this other notion that uh, with Kini, Kini, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where the WC yes. is. Is it right? That's right. Yes. Uh, they have this notion that in order to cope with uh, recursion theory, and with uh, the antinomies um, that result from Cantor diagonalization, uh, and uh, in particular, if you consider the notion of computability, um, and take into account Turing's undecidability, Turing undecidability, in order to characterize the notion of what is computable, you need a partial recursive function. I hope I said this correctly. So, sometimes you plug something in into an algorithm and you just don't know whether it's defined or not because it might not hold, the computation may not hold and you may uh, uh, wait forever for a very long time uh, to see if it doesn't work. And this time is not bounded by any computable function. This is, this is, this is uh, the real, the real gist of this, you know. You cannot, you cannot have computable bounds to wait, of waiting times, to see whether this evaluates or not. This is connected to the hardware problem. Actually, if you quantify this, there exists this piece of lever function. Do you, have, have you heard about this piece of lever function? It's a, it's a cute function. It, it is, this was, I think, by Rado, uh, not Rado, I forgot about it, I'm sorry. So if you, if you type in, if you Google this people function, you can find the creator. But uh, this, this person, uh, this researcher asked, what is the highest number 
of once the computer print out and hold. You know, of course, I can immediately uh, do an infinite do loop, doing, giving an infinite uh, um, sequence of ones. But this is not. But this is not uh, what is asked here. What is asked here is um, it should print out a large number of ones and then hold. Uh, and this turns out to be the funny uh, uh, thing. There exist competitions because for any universal computer, and it's, only, it's mostly interesting to, to discuss it with and depending on that computer model, um, uh, it, it starts out to be computable. Uh, ah, so I, I'm sorry. So, and the function, and the function is. Um, the, the argument is the number of bits specifying that program. So the function of n, where n is the number of bits specifying that program on that particular computer. So, so if you have a small size program, it might still be possible to compute this time, because you just don't have to wait for long. But by reduction to the hiking problem, it's it's quite reasonable uh, to immediately realize that this number, this, this function grows faster than any computable number. So it grows faster than the Ackermann function and so on. So this is, grows very fast. You know? and, 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 and Chardin's omega is one, another example, the hiking probability. So those things have no, uh, no computable ranges of conversions if you compute them. And therefore, they are used to this notion that you, it looks like a function, but it is only a partial function, because you cannot say if you, if you get an answer. This is just a matter of uh, recursive, life of recursive function theory. And, and we, want, we wanted to have that too here. We wanted to accept that if it's not determined, we can't say anything about that. So what, what is determined in our proof is that two cases, we call that a viable value assignment in 3D. If you got one, one, our postulate is then the others must be, so they, are, they have a definite value, must, have, must be zero. Yeah? And the second value assignment we have is that if you have two, this is the inverse situation, if you have two um, uh, zeros, uh, the third must be a one. That's quite reasonable. But, but if you have nothing, or just one zero, the others remain, in our case, undefined. Whereas in Pitovsky's case, they are all given, they are not definitely. So, so we think our assumptions are weaker, and also we have a, a very uh, uh, compact group. The compact, compactness is also negotiable, but, uh, but I think this is, uh, this is uh, um, more general. And yes, yes. Yeah. One question. That the proof by because the, the, the schema that you've shown me of the proof is by contradiction, yes? Yes. Because I if I if I assume that this is true, I give you this. And if I assume that it's false, I give you this. And the proof by specular cohen is constructed. Yeah? It's, it's also by, by contradiction. But the coach inspector here but they you don't give the, the configuration that shows you the Yes, yes. I will also show you our configuration. I, I just gave you the proof structure. Co the coach inspector is very much in the same spirit because coach inspector is gives you a finite uh, configuration, a quantum cloud, and then proves that with certain assumptions that is the overall it's not with this. 
So this is in a sense extension of Kolchus Specker or a Kolchus Specker, if you like. Uh, so it, it shows you that no two valued measures exist. No two valued measures exist. So and, and our and our thing has a nice property because it can be meshed. You will see that in a second. Yeah. So if you if you you know because this lacks just a couple of contexts which this has, and this lacks a couple of contexts which which this has, but the others are identical. I mean, you, you might say, how, how did you find such a thing? It's just a question of trial and error, but we, we have found one. Yeah. So, so basically, it's, it's kind of the same, uh, same technique. I give you some um, quantum cloud, and I can prove that by the rules here, by these rules, I mean, uh, Coach and Specker would not the original project beta proof would not go through with these weaker rules, you know, because because uh, you have to make some assumptions. You know, you say, well, these are value dating; they are not partial. We allow for partiality, so in a sense, that's stronger also. Our, and our assumption, because our assumptions are weaker, because we allow partiality. I mean, you might say, well, this is not, not, not very important to me, but, but I think from a mathematical standpoint, it's certainly stronger. Impatiality is a nice thing, you know, because it, I, I think it's, it's, it's not characterizing, but it's in the spirit of uh, value indefiniteness that the was talking about. So, and, so and the, the coach is Becker proof is a proof by contradiction. I give you the quantum cloud and let you work out all cases uh, uh, of two-valued possibilities of two-valued measure, and you find that all all those cases here. The graph on top is a is a Tisch graph because uh, that that uh, atom that is labeled by one here. Um, Implied that, that this, if this is one, um, the whole thing has only one. Uh, this whole quantum cloud. You, ha you have to look at the starting point. This is the one, and the end point, the terminal point, is the two, three, four, five, six, seven label. Yeah, it's just because I, I use some uh, partition logic for that. But. You must believe me that this has a faithful orthogonal representation. And the faithful orthogonal representation is contained in our paper uh, in the uh, Journal of Mathematical Physics. Yeah? We give explicit uh, representation of this type. And so so the top one, the top cloud is a is a is a TIFS, and uh, the middle cloud is a TITS. So true implies true on the endpoint label, and uh, the bottom cloud is a is a concatenate. No, it's a it's a it's a mesh of, of those two because I uh, see there are just two two contexts missing uh, on the top and the middle, and I just I just add all four contexts together, and I get that if 30, uh, 36 is true, that's the 36th atom. The 37th atom uh, has no value. So, and of course, in this concrete orthogonal representation, in this concrete orthogonal representation I am referring to, um, this is just one. So I have just proven that given one is true, um, and another vector cannot be uh, valued. Now you can argue already with this that with that you get uh, a quantum random number generator based on value indefiniteness. Yeah, but uh, another another. Uh, uh, Part of the proof is to prove that 
this can be this value intention this can be extended to almost everywhere. This is another part of the proof. And I kindly ask you to look at at the uh, at our Channel uh, of Mathematical Physics paper for that. Find what's determinant of. Oh, time. I just. That's just like a choice, personal choice. This is my personal choice. Yes. And the, I mean, the real funny thing. I mean, the funny, the, the interesting thing is that that what I like personally in the proof uh, that these clouds that that you need just a few that that they have enough two valued measures. Uh, the, the top and the, and the bottom ones to get you separation. Yeah? But, but, if you, but if you add those two, just two, uh, you, you get this, this blows up. You know? so, so you cannot re classically represent it any longer in, in, a, in, a, in a partition logic which would faithfully represent the diagram. Um, and it's very explicit. You can you can check it. I mean, uh, and, and, and the, the technical thing is that these um, two value assignments I gave on top and the middle are the only ones. Given that one and one prime is uh, is one, which are allowed. So these are the only ones. There exist more, but uh, not. But in all of, but in all the, the other ones, one and one prime needs to be zero. Yeah. There exist thirteen actually. Red, red is true. Yeah, it is true. Okay. Yeah. So these are these are structures so, whose so only uh, one true valuation are those. Yes, and, and and you have and you can do that with with this rules. So I, we would allow even uh, partiality, but uh, these are strong enough to uh, to be value definite of just the entire cloud, even with these rules of it. And this, as I said, this can be extended um, such that the angle between this and that can be anything except 0 and pi over 2. And this proves this theorem with that assumption, which is then not a Pitovsky theorem, it's ours, but Pitovsky has that with a global truth assignment allowing for assuming that this is not a partial function but a total function. <coughs> so now the question is uh, what does this imply? Of, I mean there, there are two roots I think you can interpret uh, or two modes you can interpret it. I, I tend to interpret it in the sobering mode, which I give in a second. The more exciting mode is that I say we can prove that whenever you prepare a state, all measurements of individual particles which do not reproduce this preparation state but which are in some angle, some tilt, and not autonomous guarantees you by quantum mechanics and by the theorem uh, a good quantum random number generator. So it's guaranteed, certified by yeah, certified by quantum value. So this goes into technology. You know? I certify you that this apparatus that uh, Quantis is selling, for instance, ID Quantic, they have this Quantis random number generator. They, well, they actually work in two-dimensional hyperspace. But if you work in 3D, you are fine. The more sobering 
um, uh, view of this is that this is in your imagination only. You know, all those quantum clouds. Because all you can measure is just one context. And who guarantees you that this exists? So we are at, we are in the age old debate of realism and e idealism. I mean, this, is, this has nothing to do with mathematics. The mathematics is okay. You know? I'm, not, I'm not negotiating this, of course, because it's not negotiated. But, uh, but the implication uh, is different. The implication is if you're an idealist, you would say, well, this is, uh, this is the thought through and through, as it's in the new uh, Oxford University Press book. You know? This is thought. All these constructions, the quantum clouds, are thought through and through and through. And uh, I mean, we get all kinds of goodies, but uh, only if you assume that they that there actually should exist something there without observe without us observing it. So I will leave you with that. I tend to be more pessimistic. As I, my father comes from Moravia, as Gödel. And they are always very pessimistic about uh, the slabs. Sometimes are always uh, are very in a bad mood. Sometimes, so they they, they tend to be pessimistic. My my uh, 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 favorite uh, interpretation would also be that this kind of proves that um, that um, that we are talking about. Uh, concepts which we have no operational handle on it and so um, we should rather be and uh, not take them technolo technology wise too serious and, and, and my, my final remark is if you really want uh, I mean for all practical purposes this is the famous against measurement paper of uh, late uh, day for all practical purposes, uh, the quantum random number generators will, will turn out to, to do the job, you know? Even if you don't believe in these kind of arguments. But, but really, if you, uh, I mean, if you, if you press me hard, I would rather accept a random number generator based on some large pos position of pi. You know, there exist now algorithms which can, with, where you don't need to, to compute the entire sequence, but you just pinpoint a large position of pi and then from then go wild. Or, um, or a Champanons number, which is just a, a base 2 and enumeration of, of the natural numbers put in sequence. This, this is provable for any normal. Yeah, so, so every expected partial sequence happens with, this, with the expected frequency. Here we don't have a proof. We just say it's very indefinite, whatever that means. Yeah. So, so if I would, be, would build a bridge, I would rather rely on Chapman's now, actually, to, to do some, some, uh, some approximations uh, in, in the statics. But, of course, this is up to you and up to the people uh, and, and their belief system. So I think I will stop here. Um, and next uh, we'll probably talk about uh, automaton logic and then about the bell thing. Yeah. And that, that will be a good transition to Professor uh, OK. Cool, great. 15 minutes.